thank you for coming to this lecture. And I have the pleasure to introduce Gehan Fischer. I think the most of you or half of you know him well because you were in the course of him. And the other half uh, probably from the publications. I tell you a little bit about him because the CV is very long. I cannot say everything about him, but I can just give an impression who he is. Gerhard Fischer is a professor, is adjunct and emeritus professor uh, in the Department of Computer Science uh, in Colorado, at the University of Colorado Boulder. He has a fellowship there and the director of the Center for Lifelong Learning and Design. I think we will. Here a little bit about that today too. Um, he's a member of the Computer Human Interaction Academy, a fellow of the ACM, and recipient of the Rigo Award of ACM CIPRO. He was awarded uh, as honorary doctorate from the University of Gothenburg. And your research uh, interests are new conceptual frameworks and new media for learning, working, and collaborating and human-centered computing and design. I think this was also the main reason why we invited you for our PhD school for media and human-centered technology. And currently, you are working on quality of life in the digital age, social creativity, meta-design, cultures of participation, design trade-offs, and rich landscapes for learning. So also the MOOCs. You have masters in mathematics and PhD in computer science, and both in Germany. So that means you were working also in Germany in several places. I checked. I'm not putting it there. Uh, and you moved then to Boulder, and then actually worked the most time, except some uh, uh, travels to other countries. Um, you have. I count them, 280 scientific publications, probably more, but I could see how many. And then the principal investigator or co-principal investigator of a huge number of research projects, you didn't put numbers on that and I didn't count them, but it's long. the list was very long. And you are still very active in research. So um, I actually met you personally in Hanover. You had a symposium there about um, digitalization and quality of life and trade-offs, tra tra uh, design trade-offs, and these were very nice format with presentation and discussions afterwards. And, um, and we thought there maybe you should come to Vienna and then also talk uh, to our students and to us. So here today, uh, not the teaching, today is the presentation, is so if you have a lecture series in Central of Informatics and Society. This is uh, founded at our Faculty of Informatics, and our team is also here, and we are working since two years on current topics uh, connected to technology use in society and impact and also the changes happening in our society and I think your topic fits very well into that and so the topic is exploring design trade-offs for quality of life in human centered design. Well <coughs> thanks for the invitation. Uh, I always like to come to Vienna. I have been here a few times before, so this was another opportunity to come here. And as Hilda said, I have worked on these issues for some time. And what I would like to do in today's lecture is to go through these themes, which are basically were contained in the title. And let me start, start off with sort of a basic, what I consider a basic message. That focus in science and technology and being a member of a computer science department, I am in some ways a technologist, that technology achieved that what we cannot do it, we can do it. And I gave some example 
to a broad range of different topics, nuclear energy, renewable energy, reproductive medicine, and then a little bit more tailored maybe to our interest, automation, ubiquitous computing, personalization, total recall, self-driving cars. And one could go on with additional topics. But the question which I am really interested in, and which I want to convince you today, which I think fits well with the Center for Informatic in society here, is while the cannot do it, you can do it, is a question of technology. Uh, there is also the question, should it be done? And I would say the theme of quality of life is an issue which relates to should it be done? This is a way to judge developments uh, from a quality of life perspective. And you talk about ethics, values, impact, choice, control, and autonomy, and I will demonstrate that all of these topics lead to design trade-offs. Now, because I live in America, uh, and we are here in Europe, uh, there is a slogan to differentiate the two places. In America, <coughs> nothing matters and everything goes, and in Europe, everything matters and nothing goes probably a little bit exaggeration, uh, but I think there is some truth to it. So if you ask, should it be done? I mean, there have been big discussions about nuclear power plants, and again, different countries like Germany decided to get out of <coughs> nuclear power. There's currently a big discussion, I don't know how much this is the case in Austria, about autonomous warfare. I mean, in the old days, in wars, human pilots were flying and decided, should I throw a bomb? Am I you know, forced to throw a bomb? Nowadays, people sit in an office in Nevada and decide whether a drone should throw a bomb. And autonomous warfare means this is not decided by human beings anymore, but by... Uh, an algorithm. This is autonomous warfare, and there are, I mean, substantial opposition to this uh, in the United States uh, that people say, no, this should not be done. Self driving cars is a hot topic. Uh, cashier free stores. Amazon just started to open totally cashier free stores. Distributed cognition. I think we have prosthetic and remedial uh, technologies, and they are usually seen uncontroversial and benign. But then there is transhumanist research that we all get a chip in, implanted to make up for maybe some of the things which we can do so well. Uh, and this are, those are often seen uh, as controversial, potentially dangerous, and anxiety provoking. And you may all have your own ideas on these topics. Should it be done, as far as I understand, and probably the people from the center should uh, decide this or make comments about this, but it seems to me it is a question which I assume is also of some importance for the people in the center. So, I mean, should it be done, I inserted this slide earlier today, it's also a timely topic. So I read uh, the Süddeutsche Zeitung, the major German newspaper online quite often, and as you can see from the date, it was the title story this morning, uh, Digitalisierung Arbeit aus dem Automaten, it was a story about Austria, and the question was uh, that the Arbeitsagentur 
though similar to autonomous warfare, rely on algorithm uh, whether you, who should get a job and who should not get a job. And you can read the article, but in some ways, the overriding issue of digitalization is how much of responsibilities should we delegate as human beings to the computer. So this is sort of the basic framing of what I want to say. And let me say a couple of words first about design. I think it's a very misunderstood concept. Uh, if you are a software engineer, which maybe some of you are, then people see it as a face in a waterfall type model. For me, in, uh, I have worked for a long time with the definition of design or the conceptualization that there are the natural science, which studies how things are, physics, astronomy, and so on. There are laws, there are right answers. Whereas in the sciences of the artificial, it studies how things ought to be. Uh, so there are no natural laws for it. And it, I have worked for a long time in human-computer interaction and different steps towards human-centered design. It started off that we worried about usable system, then the recognition was made usable systems which are not useful, are also not of a great, uh, uh, or is also not desirable. And then systems, as we carry now computers around, became ubiquitous. Uh, then people worried about engaging, uh, that people could get easily into system, but <coughs> remained interested to learn more about them. And so quality of life is another design criteria, which I think fits well in the development of human-computer interaction. Uh, systems. Let me skip this one. So, in software design, there are two major phases. One which I label upstream, where we have the world which exists, which we want to model, in which we want to create for the world new design. We and then we come up with a model. This is maybe sort of a written description, maybe a prototype. And then from this model, we create a system. And historically, I think computer science research was very much focused on what I call the downstream activities, to go from a model to a system, to create algorithms from the specification. I think the challenge, which is equally large, uh, from my point, somewhat which has been neglected in the detailed uh, in the detailed study is what I label upstream activities. And we cope with ill-defined problems and we may solve, uh, we may come up with the right solution going from the model to the system, but we started off with solving the wrong problem. And I will give you examples of that. So these are called design disasters. On the downstream side, you have well more well-defined problems to deal with difficult technical problems. We want to create reliable code, code, and the failure leads to implementation disasters. We have the wrong solution to the right problem. So the problem as is specified in the model is the right problem, but we come up with the wrong solution. So I talk now a little bit about design. So the next concept is quality of life. A huge concept and uh, it has a wide range of different contexts and I enumerated here some of them. And obviously there are many aspects which uh, are outside the immediate research concerns which we have pursued. So this is why I emphasize digital technologies. This is the area uh, where we have tried to gain a better understanding of. So just to give you a sense, this is goals for quality of life as 
articulated by the United Nations, and it contains objectives like no, uh, no poverty, uh, quality education, gender equality, all huge problems, which I think are all very important elements of quality of life. But as I said, I want to focus uh, on the perspective, what can we as computer scientists contribute to this discussion? So one thing in uh, uh, defining it is sort of the well-being, the quality of life being measured as the well-being of individuals, the happiness of individuals. And there's also a World Happiness Report. So uh, some way, another, how do we capture the notion of happiness of life? And in 2018, Finland is number one. Uh, and I mean, this despite that it can be cold there, uh, they have a fairly high percentage of foreigners. And as contrary, uh, the United States is only number 18. And if you compare the factors which people mention, what contribute to the Finnish happiness, it's life expectancy, social support, and little corruption, what uh, led to the relative low, rank low ranking of the United States, public health problems, opioid addiction, high income equality, declining trust, generosity, and social support. I mean, there are many other dimensions, like most of the countries, if you see in the third bullet, are relatively small countries. One could make the conjecture that for larger countries, uh, they face additional problems. So this is sort of a very global image. Now, I have asked in, uh, in courses which I have taught, students which I have worked with, I developed a questionnaire, uh, including the class which I taught here at the Technical <coughs> University. And I asked them, how have some of these systems which are on these lists like email, smartphone, Facebook, Twitter, Wikipedia, Uber, Airbnb, navigation systems, Wi-Fi on airplanes, do-it-yourself opportunities, self-driving cars, smart home devices. How have, so, how have those impacted your life, your quality of life? And here is sort of a selection of answers which the people have been given. Uh, be able to choose and decide things. So in some ways, we have derived from this issue our ideas about how to allow people to act more as designers rather than just users. Be able to be in touch with friends and, and smart people. Modern technology have helped us to get together with people who are not necessarily co-located with us. Be in an environment where people enjoy learning and sharing. We have the Center for Lifelong Learning, so this has been really one of the very major topics for us. Be able to have a flexible work and leisure schedule. In Germany, there was a huge discussion about work-life balance. I don't know how it is in uh, Austria, but I assume this is also probably a topic for your society. What I like uh, also to see is afford to be lazy once in a while. I think it's a legitimate concern which we might have and be <coughs> healthy and happy. So I put together a few slides maybe related to you know, the trade-offs which I will talk about in the second caused by smartphones. So for example, uh, in the old days, on the left side, this was then, and this is now. And often if I sit in a restaurant, I actually observe people. And I would say the picture on the bottom is not too uncommon. This is also then and now, the slightly different setting. Or here is the last one, then and now. Uh, I don't know if you would agree that these images are 
realistic, at least to some extent. Another one, I don't know, I hope you don't have to think about this too <laughs> soon. Uh, uh, what would you like to put on your gravestone? And in the good old days, you know, there was people said, beloved mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. And the modern tom uh, tombstone, you see the guy died in 2064, and, but he counted his Twitter followers, uh, how much calories he has consumed, how many miles he has jogged. So you can think, imagining that at some point we probably all will die, what, who, what you would like to see on your gravestone. So the next topic is design trade-offs. And uh, I assume Austrians also, some of them read Faust, and the notion of Faustian bargain uh, is part of uh, the culture that we, by making decisions, we gain something and at the same time we lose something. I argued earlier that design is choice, uh, contrary to the natural design. There are no correct solutions or right answers, but trade-offs, and I want to illustrate some of the trade-offs. So the examples which I want to go through is that there are uh, the domain is human-computer relationships, and you can either automate, and this is the domain of artificial intelligence, which currently is a big topic around the world. Maybe one can say there is substantial hype associated with it. It replaces the human being. I have been more interested, in our research, we have been more interested in informate, empowering human beings, in augment human intelligence. Then involvement and participation, you have some consumer cultures and you have cultures of participation where people can actively participate. So just to give you one example of that we also have built systems, this was a system which I have used for all kinds of purposes to illustrate points because we worked on it for over 10 years. It's a tabletop computing environment. So the vertical uh, table in the front is actually a computer. And people gather around the table to make decisions. And so we use this working with communities in Boulder, in the city where I live, to design new bus routes, to bring up controversial points, to allow people to discuss these issues. And in the background, the horizontal screen is used to investigate it related information. Maybe someone would know that a similar decision was discussed in the city of Portland. And so we can access this information uh, to see what other people have decided. We used this uh, and studied the impact of it these are two high-level committees, the Boulder City Council and the University of Colorado Regents. And uh, one person who observed uh, this meeting said afterwards this was the <coughs> first meeting between these two groups where they felt they reached some interesting consensus about uh, difficult issues. And I could talk about the technical aspects of tabletop computing, of how we created tangible interfaces to allow people with no uh, detailed computer science knowledge to cope with these systems and to act as active contributors uh, rather than designers rather than just passive users. So, this is an image of Boulder. The city is situated in front of the Rocky Mountains. And one of the most controversial issues is building heights. Uh, so nobody wants to live somewhere and someone else decides we build a new building and uh, this new building has a height which blocks the view of the mountains. And 
to do this all in your head is quite complicated. So what we try to analyze and understand whether a system like this would lead to a deeper exploration of design trade-offs and would also allow people to come to more mutual understanding because they can see how the effect of a certain decision what will imply this for them personally. Uh, here is a study from the group here uh, which works uh, on a somewhat related problems and they try to uh, find also urban uh, transportation issues and they wanted to understand how e-scooters could, uh, could impact uh, transportation in Aspen Seastadt. You may know more about this than I do. Uh, and to explore the citizen interest in sustainable uh, mobility and eco-feedback tools. And they also identified different trade-offs in the context of this research project. So if you want to know more about this, see how these trade-offs play a role, you can talk to them because they know more about this than I do. So one issue is, do we want to be consumers or do we want to be designers? And in a democracy, I mean, one simple thing where we can be designer is that we can vote every so often. And here are a couple of quotes uh, which give sort of positive evidence uh, that it may be important for some people that they can contribute to a decision because they like a decision better if they have a feeling that they had a saying about it. But for my own history, I wrote a paper uh, very early on where I assumed, you know, we all should be active contributors and designers until I figured out, yeah, I sometimes also like to be a consumer. And I think the interesting design trade-off is that we sometimes want to be designers but are forced to be consumers. And my argument is, this is in personal and meaningful activities. We care about these issues. But there are also situations where we are forced to be designers, where we rather want to be consumers, because this is in personally irrelevant activities. And we work quite a bit with the concept, what it would mean and how to avoid it, that there is something like participation overload. And I give you one annoying example as I traveled over the last few weeks. You go to a hotel, you uh, take a flight, and within the next 24 hours, you get an email message and say, yes, we want to improve our services. Wouldn't you like to you know, go through, uh, through a questionnaire and answer some of these questions? I assume most of you will have sympathy for this. And I think it's not a bad idea, but with the frequency, I could spend a substantial amount of my time uh, to answer all these questionnaires. Let me get to one more design trade-off, and this is about context-aware systems. I mean, here's the issue is that if our computational artifacts have some understanding of a context, uh, what does that do good for us. And you can think about <coughs> filter bubbles, group thing versus making all voices heard. Just out of curiosity, who has heard of the term filter bubbles? So quite a few. Uh, I think uh, one of the examples which I use often is in the United States we have 24-hour news services, and two of the uh, are CNN and Fox News. And if you watch exclusively one or the other, you probably come to the, or uh, you believe that you live in two different worlds. 
And uh, I think with many of the modern techniques which we develop, uh, this increases the notion of filter bubbles and potentially leads to problems that people continue uh, to talk to each other and discuss issues. We can make information relevant to the task at ten, but if we lose serendipity, isn't that a critical issue too? We can feel too much intrusiveness, but the other side of the coin is reacting too late. There are efforts that we remember all, and that we, you know, someone makes a recording of this talk, but even in private talks, people, there are these people who believe in total recall, wear microphones and cameras, and so we will remember everything. Uh, versus the opposite is what is the value that we forget things. Personalization versus privacy. I will say a couple of more words about this. Uh, I, uh, for example, in many of the learning environments, personalization plays a critical role. Sometimes people think, you know, this is really a major step forward. Uh, but uh, the negative thing is that in order to achieve personalization, uh, there is a loss of uh, privacy and uh, there is also uh, the other thing which I mentioned before, there is the difficulties of groupthink and filter bubbles which uh, because the personalization protects you from whatever the designers of the system think is irrelevant information. So we may ask, what is the value added by analyzing design trade-offs? Well, I think they avoid that we believe in over oversimplified solutions. And currently, there is uh, development, I would say, around the world where certain groups promise uh, that there are simple solutions to complex problems. And this, I think, has uh, dangers which can be overcome by saying we want to analyze carefully the design trade-offs. I will say a little bit more in a second about the uh, a uh, green point of how do we identify truly limiting, limiting factors. Uh, there's a nice quote from Habermas saying, der gedankliche Horizont schrumpft, wenn man nicht mehr in Alternativen denkt. And the last point is, there are no decontextualized sweet spots. So if we have design trade-offs, I think to say one solution is better than the other one without exploring the surrounding uh, context and saying what are the assumptions behind it to come to these decisions, uh, we usually cannot say that one decision is better than the other. So here's an example uh, of finding the limiting resources. It relates back to this slide of upstream activities versus downstream activities, namely to find the right solution to the wrong problem. It's a very simple example, but I think because it is simple, I found it was sort of had a guiding effort for some of our developments. So the story was that in uh, states of crisis, uh, the State Department in the United States uh, found out that the printers which they had at the time were much too slow to uh, print, and so there were huge backups which prevented that important information did not uh, get printed, and so they were seriously delayed in uh, the messages were seriously delayed in transmission. Then 
Some people got together and say identified building capacity as a limiting factor. And the solution proposed was one should buy faster printers. And what happened was that this only helped to uncover the real problems, the truly limiting resources. Namely, the printers were now very fast, and there were piles of printed information. Uh, but the really limited process was that people digested the information. It didn't only exist on paper. Now you could say, you know, we have further computational techniques like intelligent summarizing, personalization, making information relevant uh, to particular topic. But at least the first problem to buy pr a faster printer was the uh, was the right solution to the wrong problem. So, just to show that this happens not only with a simple problem, yeah. and again, another design trade of analysis uh, out of a slightly different uh, world or different topic. On September 11th, uh, there was a terrorist attack on the World Trade Center in New York. And then, again, people got together and say, how could that have happened? And what can we do about it? And the problem was identified that we should hinder the terrorists to enter the cockpit. And subsequently, desi uh, design guidelines for secure doors were developed. This was a technological solution. In another very sad event, which happened 14 years later, was when uh, a, a flight from German wings was steered by the co-pilot into a mountain in southern France and all people died. And the analysis of this problem showed that the captain got out of the cockpit, then the co-captain locked the door, the captain couldn't get back in. And so now we know that the original uh, identification of the problem had uh, big limitations and now we kind of try with the next step, trying to uh, again analyze the design trade-offs and so the problem was then subsequently conceptualized, do not leave a single person in the cockpit and you have different solutions to find this out. And important is sort of the iterative design uh, driven by breakdowns. So self-driving cars, a real big topic. The question based on what I just said is, is that really the real problem? And I have tried to draw out here uh, a kind of uh, map of different issues where as I haven't really explored or documented that uh, maybe mobility we reduce the need for it by saying well we have telework, we have Skype and Hangouts, so there's no need that people go to offices all the time, travel around in the world. So an interesting question would be uh, me coming here for this lecture today, what would be the difference had I stayed in Boulder, Colorado and there would have been a nice big screen and I would have spoken via the big screen. So we can analyze what are, is there still a value in being physically there? Now, I elaborated a little bit more uh, the question that we want to move around in the world. And the major alternatives are mass transportation, which I then also subsequently didn't develop further. And then there's the automobile. And there are a lot of different factors, like self-driving cars. <coughs> Uh, a blessing maybe for someone who has driven a car for his or her life and then 
as people get older, suffer from cognitive uh, dif uh, 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 problems, and they cannot drive anymore. For them, self-driving cars could be a big blessing. For as a big issue about safety, how do human-driven cars compare to self-driving cars with respect to sa safety? There are enjoyment uh, in human-driven cars. And there is a question which I labeled earlier between replacing human beings versus empowering, augmenting human capabilities, whether driver assistance systems are maybe not the more important <coughs> issue to explore at this point of time. Then we can look into environmental impact, into cost. I think uh, the big alternative model, which is also pursued in mobility for all, is that car sharing uh, becomes a more realistic ob objective rather than uh, people owning cars. So my point is, inside of this diagram, there are numerous interesting technical issues which we as computer scientists can pursue. Building self-driving car is a huge challenge. Uh, even building good driver assistance systems is still a big issue and the question is will in the long run computer companies build cars because a, a car is basically a computer on wheels or will car companies uh, acquire enough expertise so in computer science so they can equip their cars with, with the right kind of systems. Let me finish with mentioning one more work which I found very interesting. It's based on a book called Libertarian Paternalism. And again, in the title you see there are improving decisions about health, wealth, and happiness. All factors related to quality of life. And what the book is all about is that a design trade-off where Paternalism is an element where someone thinks, uh, maybe a government, maybe parents, maybe teachers, that you should behave in a certain way, people should behave in a certain way, and they are encouraged to do so. So saving for retirement, thinking about this at age 25 or 30 rather than at age 55 or 60. And the nudge is to push these people a little bit in this direction. But the design trade-off is that it's libertarian paternalism. So if people decide, no, I don't want to do that, so they are allowed to do so. And uh, so the critics who argue against nudges believe that uh, they should not be dominated by outside sources. And again, we can contextualize this as many levels, and we can think what does it mean for systems, like should we have good defaults uh, if people don't want to act. And the supporter of Nudges argue that whatever is set as an agenda, there are some elements that one would move in a certain direction. And that the libertarian part allows individuals to be free to do what they like to do. So in conclusion, uh, I think my argument is really that the future is not out there to be discovered, how Columbus discovered America. But it has to be invented and designed. And we as computer scientists, I think, develop a lot of techniques which go way beyond that we can implement the right kind of algorithm. I think to return to the very beginning, we should also ask ourselves, and maybe we should uh, talk with students if we are faculty members, that should we do it is a legitimate <coughs> question which comes up in many contexts. 
So we can ask, invented and designed by whom? Is it that he takes the easy way out and say by them? And by them means, well, by Apple, by Facebook, they determine the systems which we have, which we use. By you, I mean, what, you know, can we all, you, uh, contribute to this, or by us? And technology, we should always understand, is not destiny, but we should attempt and contribute uh, to shape technology. And maybe one of the grand challenges is that we don't engage in a race against the machine. I mean, machines can do m many things better than we can do. Uh, in the meantime, if I used to play against a chess program and had somewhat a chance. I have no chance whatsoever now. And even the best chess player in the world has no chance. So what would it mean to engage in a race with the machine that we build symbiotic systems? And so what I try to convince you and give you sort of evidence from a very broad perspective without going into details of any particular subject or project is that quality of life may be an important goal which we should not overlook. And that if we engage in this type of research, one necessary condition is that we will have to explore design trade-offs, and this will help us to better understand problems and maybe stay away from joining populist opinions where easy solutions are uh, promised to the complex problems of this world. Thank you. Thank you for this talk. Uh, we have some time for a few questions before we move into a more informal context, I'd say. I a little bit back. Everybody, <laughs> <laughs> Questions, please. At the end, it's a very political decision, okay? And it's a societal decision, it's a decision by society. And how can we avoid to come into this federalistic approach or the other way around? What is the role of experts we are in this overall social decision process? Because at the end, it's really how we design systems, how we want to live is that, and what is the normative objective. And this is a political issue. Do you agree first with this my statement, and second, what is your answer? Well, maybe I would sort of turn it around and say, yeah, politics mostly also faces uh, problems which are ill-defined, wicked, and where design trade-offs <coughs> are present everywhere. Uh, I mean, you know, if you take a, a problem now, uh, the Saudis supposedly, whatever, killed uh, this critic, and the Germans now, you know, face, are we standing up for human rights? Yeah. Uh, uh, and so maybe don't provide arms anymore for the Saudis, or are we uh, hurting our economic uh, viability because the Saudis have become an important trading partner for us? So this is a question which German politics at the moment faces, other nations as well. And this is a design trade-off question. And we now can say, can we explore this? Can we find factors, do a careful evaluation? 
and you probably end up with people having different opinions. I mean, I have my personal opinion about this issue, and I would defend this in a discussion uh, against other people. So the second issue asks, you know, what is the role of experts? This is a, a, a definitely our society has expert needs expert, but I think there are also issues where expertise is distributed. So let's say a doctor is an expert, and in many ways he is more he or she is more an expert than I am. But if a doctor makes a decision, it is my body, and it's my belief whether I want to have life-saving. Uh, support or not and so in many of these situations experts are welcome and we, we are glad we should have ex people with expertise but I think we should not blindly <coughs> believe these experts and again from why we developed the system which I showed you was uh, to better understand that, let's say, a city council or traffic planners wouldn't build the best systems, but the neighborhood people living in this environment should also have a voice. So it's a moderation role? Well, the system as such, yeah, I think helps maybe to some of the other claims or aspects which I said that we often trying just to understand what the problem is, to identify the different issues, can be enriched by having more voices contribute to it. And if we don't do this, then we may solve uh, or have the right solution to the wrong problem. And the interesting question is that I think Computer science historically was concerned with the, the technical issues. But I think many of these questions where we ask how should we proceed, or how should we conceptualize the problems, I think that it's then technically correctly implemented uh, is without, in many situations, still a huge challenge. But we have to avoid that we come up with the right solution to the wrong problem. And we have to be aware that with these design problems, to uh, design trade-offs, in my mind, open a design space. They enrich the design space. They allow us to think more <coughs> carefully, whereas design requirements, if we focus on them too early, narrows the design space down, makes it then things more operational. And so this are uh, another conflicting situation where I think these are issues for computer science now and in the future. Yeah. I want to follow up on, on this, and I think I, I also would think that a lot of computer science is very political and it probably never been as political as it is now. Uh, a lot of these design decisions um, require spaces for us to negotiate ag agendas, and maybe if you talk about experts, I, I would say like there are a lot of very different experts as stakeholders, not least all the users are experts in their own life, right? And we are not experts in their life. We're, we're experts in maybe creating technology. You have you published quite a bit on, on this notion of met meta design and design after design or design in use. Uh, do you see that this direction could provide a negotiation space where these different agendas or, or alternative futures of technology in, in people's life could be <coughs> negotiated? Yeah, I mean, some of in you know in forty five minutes we cannot talk about everything and. Uh, maybe more in line with the CIS Center, I try to uh, choose this topic. But this topic is sort of, there are interrelationship to the maybe more narrow more or more specific questions. 
uh, and one of them is what we call meta design. And what that means, you design for designs. You give people the possibility that they can change things if they don't like it. And uh, we instantiated that in many different settings. So with the system which I showed you, I mean, in some ways, all the people who gathered around this computational enhanced table, they were designers. They could actively contribute to the thing. We studied, also derived from this, cultures of participation. So how do we understand conceptually the impact and the contribution of things like Wikipedia, <laughs> open source environments, <coughs> and similar environments. Where again, the question is, how do we motivate people to act as designers, even if we give them the possibilities? So yes, meta design is closely related to some of these issues. And the last concept, which I <coughs> only brief briefly <coughs> mentioned, libertarian paternalism is, yeah, there is a value in paternalism. The experts make good conjectures. But then we simultaneously offer uh, the libertarian part that if people dislike this, they can challenge the decision and don't feel, well, someone else had, has decided about my fate. Yeah, sure. I have uh, one question because you showed the buildings, the building height. I think that's a super important topic in Vienna as well because uh, Vienna might lose uh, UNESCO heritage if they build too high and so on. Uh, but now I was wondering why you showed this 3D model uh, <coughs> and, and how did you use it in, in, in or what, because you did not elaborate much further, you just uh, showed the topic, if you could maybe share a bit more, because in architecture the, the discussion really is not so much about, uh, also because you can show different tools to different people, how much you will actually be able to see or who can see what is the height difference then on, on the view and so on. So it's not just the height or the physical thing or the, even the, the thing of presentation, but rather the relations of how it's being built and shown and so on. I don't know if I'm, if I'm <laughs> talking, but there's this, uh, so it's not like the bridge that leaves out the bus with the poor people from the city, for example. There's this political architecture, it's rather about these relations in what way it has been built or who contracted, who paid, so maybe it's even not so much about who designs, but to look at who would want somebody to design it. <laughs> well, uh, one issue is that uh, sort of if people get together and you have a house, and you, uh, and someone wants to build a high building next to you, uh, can you imagine in your mind what this will mean? And so people get into debate with kind of uh, assumption which they cannot really instantiate. And at <coughs> the technical level, we employed Google Earth, and we could move around so everyone can say, oh, my house is here. And if these buildings, and these are very rough sketches, which got later on refined in the situation, uh, if these buildings get up, what does it mean for me personally? And so it led to a discussion <coughs> through adequate computational environments, which allowed people not to be just totally against something without any rationale for it. And uh, being able to put this in and study it from different angles led that the discussions between different sto stakeholders defending different points of view was qualitatively improved, more rationalized, and so on. So I don't know, you know, if. 
uh, how you conduct a discussion in Vienna about the height of buildings, uh, whether, you know, this is just some people like high buildings, some others don't like it, or what other issues are debated. And, but also, an important point here was that it really could be contextualized to my view where I live. And I would say this makes problems personally relevant to me rather than just looking at it in an abstract way. Any questions? If not, then uh, I have one very short enough.